as you know, for those of you who are students of this class, we have a special session today, um, which is made possible by uh, a very generous gift from uh, Mr. Robert Pence, who's with us here today. Um, this is part of a series of lectures through the Great Text Program on Dante. And I'm very uh, happy to uh, introduce you to our speaker today, who has done extensive work on uh, the Commedia, uh, especially the Inferno, which students in this class are, are currently reading. Dr. Christiana Purdy Mudares received her PhD in Italian literature at Yale University with a dissertation entitled A Sacred Banquet. Medicine and Theology in Dante's Inferno. Her doctoral work on Dante explores the intersection of science and religion in late medieval culture and was awarded the Charles H. Grangent Award by the Dante Society of America. She is currently an MAR candidate at Yale Divinity School and co-organizer of the Dante Working Group for the Whitney Humanities Center. So let us welcome Dr. Purdy Madaris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I was told to, Rob told me to see if like he's hard of hearing, so I'll try <laughs> to project. Um, thank you very much, Professor Foley, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Professor Donnelly for the invitation to be here today, and thank you especially to um, Bob Pence and his wife Susie for their ongoing sponsorship of uh, Dante's studies for initiatives like this. So, um, bodily starvation and the ravaging of the will, a reading of Inferno 32 33. As you can gather from the title, I'll be speaking to you this afternoon about one of the most controversial episodes in Dante's Inferno. The historically inspired account of a father, Count Ugolino, who was in prison with his four children and starved to death by a treacherous archbishop, and who may have been driven, we're not quite sure, to feed upon his children's flesh. Before delving into this admittedly unappetizing topic, I'd like to start by saying a few words about where this talk fits into my research. It's taken from a chapter of a book I'm working on that deals with the relationship between medicine and theology in the Divine Comedy. Among the medieval sciences, Dante integrates into his poetic summa, medicine has received a fair amount of critical attention in recent years, both clarifying and complexifying Dante's ties to the medical profession. Whether it was gleaned through membership in his native city's medical guild, or through the schools of the religious orders and the disputations of philosophers that he recalled in Comedia, the medical erudition Dante demonstrates throughout the comedy managed to confound many of his most learned <coughs> readers. This was as true in the 14th century as it was in the 19th, when inquiries into the poet's medical knowledge were carried out by physicians and medical historians suffering from an apparent epidemic of precursoritis. In a book that came out just last year called The Medieval Heart by Heather Webb, we're reminded of the 19th century thesis that Dante actually anticipated Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood by 300 years, just to give you a sense of what's been done and what's being done on Dante and medicine. It seems to me that what's been missing, though, is a consideration of how Dante's fascination with scientific medicine, with concepts that were quite new and often quite challenging from a Christian point of view, interacts with his theology. To what degree did he distinguish the good of physical health from that of spiritual uh, salvation, two conditions that so poignantly converged in his native tongue under a single word, something. And what I found is that our 21st century tendency to dichotomize the study of scientific medicine and of religion could not be further from Dante's cultural milieu. Further, that when Dante integrates medical concepts into the body of his poetry, he does so with a critical awareness of their theological weight, Cantos 32 and 33 of Inferno being a case in point. I know that many of you are familiar with the uh, ambiguous conclusion of Canto Gumino's speech, that you're finishing up Inferno, I believe, to which I alluded just a moment ago. Portia, più che dolor, potel digiuno. Then fasting had more power than grief. What could fasting do that grief could not? Kill the count? Or drive him to what Charles Singleton dismissed as an unspeakable proposition, hardly worthy of a serious rebuttal. 
The confession of cannibalism that has been extracted from this verse is a relatively recent concern in Dante criticism. Notwithstanding the medieval legend alluded to by Guglielmo Maramauro, one of Dante's 14th century commentators, that is, che mangiò dei figlioli per fame, that he ate his children out of hunger, Dante's early readers were generally more benevolent than their modern counterparts in their interpretation of this verse. A greater stumbling block for the canto's medieval commentators was posed by a medical term, the nuca, or nape of the neck as it's generally translated, which occurs at the outset of the Ugolino episode. Due to a series of interpretative missteps on the part of Dante's commentators, the term has acquired a currency in modern Italian, which obscures for us its original strangeness, along with the extra medical significance it had acquired in scholastic circles by the late 15th century. By revisiting this medieval crux, I hope to shed some new light on the much discussed power of Ugolino's hunger and on its relevance to the sin for which he is condemned. As the pilgrim makes his way through the ninth circle of hell, where traitors are immersed in the ice of Cossidus, he is stopped short on the brink of, Ante on the brink of Antenora by one of the grisliest scenes of Inferno, that of the damned devouring the damned. And this is citation one on the handout. I'll be reading in the Italian, in the original, if that's all right, and then I've provided an English translation for you to follow. So, E come il pan per fame si manduca, così il sovran li denti all'altro pose, la del cervel s'aggiugne con la nuca. Non altrimenti ti deo si rose le tempi a melanippo per disdegno, che quei faceva il peschio e l'altre cose. Compared with the similarly savage spectacle Dante recalls from Statius's The Vibe, Ugolino's cannibalistic feast on the head of his enemy, the Archbishop Ruggeri, features an anatomical precision that eluded Dante's early readers. With good reason, Bruno Nardi's philological study of the Nuca attests to the words foreignness to medieval ears and to the interpretative approximations behind its modern meaning. A medical term of Arabic origin, the Nuca or Nuka, made its way into Latin during the 12th century as the first wave of Greco-Arabic medical translation swept north of Salerno. <coughs> Within a century of its appearance at the School of Chartres, the barring was a fixture in scholastic medical discourse and a growing source of encyclopedic interest. But despite the term's rapid diffusion within and beyond Europe's burgeoning medical schools, its precise meaning remained murky for the learned layman. Confronted with this hapax and erstwhile stranger to the Italian vernacular, Dante's early commentators either bypassed the verse entirely or hazard a guess, yielding somewhat circuitous results, such as, this is clear, that is, that he was eating him above the bone of the neck, which is referred to as the nuca, where it joins the brain. <coughs> In addition to Maramaro's bone of the neck, we find the nuca defined as the rear of the skull, the scruff of the neck, the hind part of the head, the head's rear end, loosely translated. <laughs> In contrast to these anatomical approximations, one of Dante's earliest commentators, Guido da Pisa, defines the nuca as follows, and this is citation two. Scendon quod nuca est medulla spine dorsi, quae descendens acerentro per spinam dorsi dat sensum et motum nervis, operante spiritu animali, quia cerebro per nuca diffunditur ad cetros nervus. Nam spiritus animalis a posteriori parte cerebri, quae pupis capitis appellatur, procedit e per nuca penetra da domnes nervos, qui bustribuit motum et sensum. In the pars posteriori coli, dicitur cervix, eo quod perillam partem cerebrum ad medullam spine dirigitur, qui dicitur nuca. Un de cervix quasi via cerebri dicitur, qui ad essui natura est. And I apologize for the classicists in the room for my medieval barbarous uh, pronunciation. But they <laughs> in any event, what is clear is that unlike the modern name, the nuca referred not to the anatomical point envisioned by Guido's fellow commentators, but to a substance the medulla spinali, or spinal marrow, used interchangeably in modern medicine with the spinal cord. Spinal marrow referred then, as now, according to the OED, to the, quote, thick whitish cord of nerve tissue that extends from the medulla oblongata down through the spinal column, and from which the spinal nerves branch off to various parts of the body. Guido's command of the literal sense of the term allows him to move on to an interpretative question that Nardi left unanswered. Why, said he should read. Sed circa istam soluzione ori turpo dal dubium codestare, cum eni nuca se extenda per totam spina ma cerebro usque arnates, quare come subulinius magis apprehendit am emunum sum, in principio ipsius nuce, quam in alitua alia parte sui. 
Granted, the alternatives are not particularly attractive, but Guido raises a valid question. If the nuca extends from the neck to the tailbone, was it, what is it about its source, that particular point so painstakingly identified in verse 129 that so, so entices this ravenous shade? Dante's peculiar attachment to this terminus technicus gains interest in light of the controversy it sparked among his contemporaries. By the turn of the 14th century, physicians, philosophers, and theologians alike were deeply divided over the nature of this physiological crux, which they explored through a standard medical question, utrum cerebro cum whether the brain joins with the nuca, a question to which Dante has implicitly replied in the affirmative. Both the cross-section and caliber of participants in this debate suggests more than a premise for scholastic hair-splitting. Tadeo de Rotti, for example, Roger Bacon, Albert the Great, Don Scotus, Pietro Rabba, to name only a few. As it turns out, the debate through which Dante introduces his pair of political traitors had acquired an ethical, theological overlay, which he magnifies through his portrayal of their corporal punishments, both human and divine. Through a series of analogical developments that I will try to summarize as briefly as I can, the nuca, or more specifically that precise point where the brain and spinal marrow appear to converge, had become coterminous with the will. More to the immediate point, the question as to whether the brain and spinal marrow were in fact of the same substance became theologically fraught by contemporary debates over the relationship between the mind's twin powers. The intellect and the will. Is the operation of the will autonomous? or is it contingent upon the operation of the intellect? The relevance of the debate to the present cantos is heightened by a further and related question. Is the operation of the intellect contingent upon the appetites of the sensitive soul? The problem that arises is this. If the operation of the will is contingent upon that of the intellect, and if the operation of the intellect can be derailed by the lower appetites, this leaves the will in a rather precarious position. I'm making some very broad claims here about the interconnectedness of these debates, which I hope to substantiate over the course of my presentation, but I'd like it to be clear from the outset where this is going with respect to Ulia and Ugeri. I think the question Dante is raising here is not only did Ugolino eat his children, but did he have the power to do otherwise? To which I will reply with a qualified yes and a decisive no. However abhorrent the deed Dante leads us to suspect him of, the poet's otherwise gratuitous concern for clinical accuracy in his portrait of starvation, the point to which I will return, suggests that such a deed would have been morally irreprehensible. Naturally, this does not clear Ugolino from the blame of treachery, for which he is condemned to the ninth circle of inferno. And in the conclusion of my talk, I'll suggest that the juxtaposition of these two sinners may help respond to a specific question that has long been raised about the moral structure of lower hell. So, from the nuka to the will. And I apologize in advance for this excursus into medical history, but I think it's important to see how this particular point acquired the theological resonances that it did. Well, the medical points there we're looking at was canonized by Arab physicians from Pali Abbas to Avicenna, Aristotle set the terms and tenor of the debate in his treatise on animal parts, where he states unequivocally that the brain and marrow are not of the same substance. Citation four. From the marrow, we pass on in natural sequence to the brain. But there are many who think that the brain itself consists of marrow and that it forms the commencement of that substance because they see that the spinal marrow is continuous with it. In reality, the two may be said to be utterly opposite to each other in character, for of all parts of the body, there is none so cold as the brain, while marrow is of a hot nature. Secondly, of all the fluid parts of the body, it is the driest and has the least blood. The marrow, however, is of the nature of blood and not, as some think, the germinal force of semen. Thus, brain is not residual matter, nor yet is it one of the parts which are continuous with each other, but it has a character peculiar to itself. Aristotle's anonymous adversary here is, of course, his teacher. According to the physiological model immortalized by Plato and Aeneas, the marrow is both the source and fundamental constituent of human life. The brain, its direct product, is the first organ to take shape within the fetus, from which the less perfect remainder of the body is then fashioned and protected with the covering of bone. What Plato himself qualified as a likely fable actually gave expression to a venerable scientific tradition that placed the brain, marrow, and semen on a substantial continuum, preserved to this day in the Latin-derived genius from generatio. 
At stake in Aristotle's attempt to dismantle this association was the ancient debate over the body's organic ruler. Was it the head or was it the heart? Not long after Aristotle's death, science took the balance in Plato's favor. Aristotle's reduction of the brain to a mere cooling agent to the seething heart was debunked by the discovery of the central nervous system by the Alexandrian founders of anatomy and physiology, Heropolis and Aristotle. By distinguishing the nerves as the sole conductors of sense impressions and motor control, they located their respective origins in a brain within which they identified a series of ventricles that were supposed to house the body's noblest animating principle, the animal spirit or psychic dharma by which sensation and motion were transmitted through the body. Undeterred by these findings, cardiocentrists proposed the following solution. While the nerves ostensibly clustered around the brain were indeed the sole conductors of sensation and motion, their source was in fact the heart. Just as the branches of a tree multiply as they rise from its trunk, so the nerves ascending from the heart ramify around the brain. In the second century of the Common Era, Plato's medical successor, Galen, made it his mission to refute this argument on empirical grounds. That the nerves did not ascend from the heart but descended from the brain was manifest by their consubstantiality, which he proved by comparing the effects of transception to the brain and spinal cord. Galen's departure from Aristotle over this physiological crux carried some collateral that would telescope its significance for future generations. While reinstating the head as the body's organic ruler for the next thousand years, Galen also expanded its powers beyond sensation and motion, identifying three discrete mental functions which he found could be independently affected by lesions to distinct areas of the brain, fantasy, reason, and memory. While galvanizing the relationship between mind and body, the development also paved the way for the psychological theories sketched by Galen's unlikely heirs, the Church Fathers. When we turn to St. Augustine's treatise on the Trinity, Galen's psychological triumvirate is adduced as evidence of man's creation in the likeness of a charming God. But it has undergone some striking developments. First of all, with respect to its contents. The three mental functions identified by Galen have been redetermined so as to foreground the power of the will, a faculty in which Augustine's pagan precursors had comparatively little interest. Dispensing, the power, dispensing of the power of fantasy, Augustine describes a mind possessed of reason, memory, and will. The bishop's no less crucial contribution was to localize the three powers within the first, second, and third ventricles of the brain, thus lending a new precision to the medical model from which his Trinitarian theology drew inspiration. <coughs> the contours of what became known as the cell doctrine were more definitively drawn by Augustine's contemporary Nemesius in his book On the Nature of Man. The Syrian bishop and former physician's more rigorous and influential version fixed the original Galenic triad of fantasy, reason, and memory within the brain's first, second, and third ventricles. From a Christian standpoint, however, this model of the mind was notably incomplete, as Nemesius was well aware. The will, which Augustine had located in the rear ventricle of the brain, was not effaced, however, but relocated. Its new seat was the source of willed movement, that is, where the brain joins the spinal marrow, or where Dante would have it, the nucleus. Although Nemesius' Greek treatise remained untranslated in the Latin West until the end of the 11th century, its 9th century translation into Arabic placed his model at the center of medieval faculty psychology. With the transplanting of patristic psychology onto essentially medical soil, however, the faculty of the will conspicuously disappeared. Unfortunately, neither Nemesius nor his Latin translator provided the actual diagrams of the brain that would become so common in the later Middle Ages, but it's rather striking that that point to which Nemesius gave such particular attention, the locus of the will, is absent from the first diagram you see in your handout, which is item 5, um, an illustration of a psychological model described by Avicenna in the 11th century. And when you turn to the second diagram, item 6, based on the revised model of Albert the Great two centuries later, there it is. The same functions are allotted to the ventricles, the important difference being the inclusion of a membrorum motiva, a power of willed movement. It's not quite legible, but the Latin inscription along the back reads that the nerves radiate through the nuca and all the vertebrae to the whole body. By the time this power was reintegrated into Western faculty psychology, however, the theological and medical landscape had changed, leaving both the will and its locus in a vulnerable position. While the patristics had skirted the materialist underpinnings of Galenic psychology, their medical successors brought them to the fore anchoring the cell doctrine to Galen's well-known theory of temperaments. 
just as each individual is born with a particular temperament or humoral disposition whose maintenance is vital to good health, so each individual organ possesses a temperament that accounts for the health of its related system. By the same token, Arab physicians concluded, the qualitative conditions of the brain's ventricles was responsible for the mental functions they housed, which could in turn be altered by a series of external factors, most immediately, diet. When the psychological model made its way west, the highly impressionable mind it took for granted became a source of fascination and concern. Not surprisingly, the mind's utter susceptibility to the body did not sit well with religious authorities, such as Etienne Temke, the Bishop of Paris, whose condemnation of 1277 took aim at the materialist implications of this view. There was, of course, an extreme alternative to this position, which posited the mind's ultimate independence of the body, namely the heroistic doctrine, the unicity of the intellect, condemned by the same bishop. Theological efforts to dodge both medical and philosophical extremes inevitably blurred the boundary between body and mind. Careful to safeguard the body's contribution to the soul's noblest operation, Thomas Aquinas deferred in the first part of his Summa Theologica to the Aristotelian tenet that the intellect cannot operate without the phantasms, that is, the images the mind preserves of external objects perceived through the senses. Equally wary of compromising the soul's subsistence, he clarified that quote, the body is not necessary to the intellectual soul by reason of its intellection considered as such, but on account of the sensitive powers, which require an organ of equitable temperament, end quote. Aquinas's concessions to the body on this delicate point came at a price. The most obvious was eschatological. How will the soul think while separated from the body? But there were also ethical implications, which come into focus in light of the scholastic debate over the relationship between the rational soul's core powers, intellect and will. Which of these, it was asked, was the superior of the mind? The intellect, which pursues truth, or the will, which pursues the good? More specifically, was the will derivative of the intellect, as Aquinas maintained among Aristotelian minds, or an autonomous power, as Franciscans such as Duns Scotus contended, following the voluntarist path paved by Augustine? Scholastic theologians were equally, if not more prone than their patristic precursors, to defer to the physicians for theological elucidation. But their appeals were inevitably complicated by the variety of medical opinions to which the body lent itself over the course of the 13th century. In the present context, unlike their early Christian counterparts, the scholastics could not appeal to the body for support without weighing in on the contemporary biomedical debate over the will's organic counterpart. Was the nuca continuous with the brain substance, or were they physiologically distinct? <coughs> By casting a spotlight on this disputed intersection in Inferno 32, Dante gives poetic expression to a debate in which he was unambiguously engaged. The poet's belief in the preeminence of the intellect over the will, articulated by Beatrice, for example, in Paradiso 28, constitutes one of the few irrefutable traces of Dante's much-discussed Thomism. It should be noted that Aquinas himself was not insensitive to the deterministic dangers of rationalism. If the operation of the intellect is contingent upon that of the sensitive soul, and all of the operations of the sensitive soul depend on an organ of equable temperament, how can the will, which is under the intellect's command, escape the contingencies of the body? Aquinas grapples with this point in the Summa when he asks whether the will can of necessity be moved by the intellect. His solution is that insofar as the reason remains free, so does the will. By his own admission, however, and this is Citation 7, the appetites can under extreme circumstances enslave the reason, as occurs in, quote, those who through a violent access of anger or concupiscence become furious or insane, just as they may from some bodily disorder, since such like passions do not take place without some change in the body. And of such, the same is to be said of irrational animals, which follow of necessity the impulse of their passions, for in them there is neither willed movement, nor movement of the reason, nor consequently of the will. In other words, when the intellect is ravaged by the lower appetites, so of necessity is its subject. In such cases, the line between man and beast disintegrates, creating a moral free zone. From Aquinas' image of a man bestialized by his appetites and thrust beyond the pale of good and evil, we return to Ugolino's final days in the Tower of Hunger, where the basest of appetites is pushed to its most violent extremes. The circumstances of the historical Ugolino's treachery and imprisonment were well known to Dante's contemporaries and preserved for future generation 
generations in Giovanni Villani's Chronicles. As recounted by his fictional counterpart, the Count's demise has evoked as much pity over the years as it has discussed. Courteously wiping his mouth with the back of Ruggeri's hair, the infernal Ugolino interrupts his savage meal to tell the Wayfarer how the Archbishop betrayed, imprisoned, and finally starved him together with his four innocent children, whom he watched perish one by one, until finally, hunger had more power than grief. The clash between the shade's savagery and the pathos inspired by his tale, the longest and perhaps the most plaintive in the Perno, only darkens his notorious last words. The recentness of this less palatable interpretation of the verse is somewhat surprising in light of the grounds for suspicion Dante lays throughout in Fredno 32 and 33. From the cannibalistic feast which Ugolino interrupts to apprise the pilgrim of his imprisonment, to the recollection of a nightmare of a pack of baby wolves devoured by sharp fangs, to the remembrance of his children's offering of their flesh as nourishment. In an essay which he entitled The False Problem of Ugolino, Jorge Luis Borges was quite right to insist on the poetic ambiguities that trump any definitive conclusion. Quote, Dante did not want us to believe that Ugolino ate his children's flesh, but he wanted us to suspect it. Uncertainty is part of his design, end quote. Granted, but if we are intended to suspect him of such a heinous act, are we not also intended to wonder at its ostensible irrelevance to the sin for which he is condemned, political betrayal? Among the innumerable autopsies that have been performed on this well-known shade, surprisingly little has been made of the medical realism Dante lends to his earthly dissolution. Far from a vain display of medical erudition, I would argue that Dante's concern for clinical accuracy within the context of punitive starvation serves to demonstrate the body's power over the mind and the ethical implications thereof. While the significance of the nuka may have eluded most of the comedy's early commentators, they had no doubts as to the clinical inspiration of Dante's portrait of starvation. Particularly transparent was the significance of the number of days so carefully counted from the morning of Ugolino's prophetic nightmare, when the door to the tower is nailed shut. And I apologize for the length of this next citation, number eight, but I'll refer you back to these uh, verses periodically in the later of my talk. <laughs> che il cibo ne solea essere adotto, e per suo sogno ciascun dubitava. Io sentì chiavar l'uscio di sotto all'orribile torre, onde io guardai nel viso ai miei figlioli, senza far molto. Io non piangea, sì dentro in Petrano. Piangeva Nelli, e Anselmuccio mio disse, tu guardi sì, padre, che hai? Perciò non l'apri mai, né risposi io, tutto quel giorno, né la notte presso. Quietami allora, per non farli più tristi. Lo dì e l'altro stemo tutti muti. Hai burra terra, perché non apristi? Coscia che fumo al quarto di venuti, Gaddo mi si gettò, disteso ai piedi, dicendo, dicendo Padre mio, che non mi aiuti. Qui vi morì, e come tu mi vedi, vedi io cascarli tre ad uno ad uno, tra il quinto dì e il sesto. Non Dio mi diedi, già cieco, a brancolar sopra ciascuno, e due di li chiamai, poiché furono morti, poscia più che il dolore, potendo giù. The precision of the shade's account of his final week was rooted for early commentators, beginning with Guido da Pisa, in the Hippocratic aphorism that man cannot survive more than seven days without food. And while we may take for granted the weaker resistance of Ugolino's children, whose ages and degrees of kinship Dante has significantly altered, the relationship between age and starvation received considerable attention among many physicians, to whom commentators from Lanonimo to Landino defer to account for the order of the prisoner's deaths. Wherever physicians stood on the standard medical quaestio as to whether the elderly were the most tolerant of prolonged fasting, they generally concur that children, by virtue of their excessive heat, were the most vulnerable to the desiccating effects of undernourishment. As for the blindness that accompanies Ugolino's rapid deterioration as the week draws to its close, while some commentators refer to the commonplace that sight is the first of the five senses to deteriorate at death, others point more precisely to the visual disturbances physicians attributed to fasting and malnutrition. Accepting the pursuit of medical realism Dante's early commentators gleaned from his depiction of starvation, I would hazard a further diagnosis. In light of the symptoms that precede and follow, Ugolino's blindness seems indicative of a more serious condition, one which humanizes, so to speak, his inhumanity. 
The starving prisoner's deterioration is not or not only a descent into the moral category of mad bestiality, the last of the three moral categories discussed by Virgil in Inferno 11, a point to which I will return. It is more fundamentally a descent into the psychological condition of bestial madness, or more precisely, bestial melancholy, the most severe of the three forms of the condition canonized by Galen and elaborated by his Arab and Latin successors. Among ancient and medieval physicians alike, melancholia received a disproportionate amount of attention among the most commonly identified forms of madness, which ranged from mania and phrenesis to epilepsy and stupor. First and foremost, one of the cardinal temperaments, melancholia was also a pathological condition caused by an imbalance of black bile, generating, among a host of symptoms, fear and despondency, for which Galen provided the following explanation in his De Lotus Apicus. Although each melancholic patient behaves differently, all of them exhibit fear or despondency. They hate everybody they see, and they live sullen and scared like children walking in deepest darkness. Just as external darkness renders almost all people fearful, thus the color of the blood <coughs> humor induces fear when its darkness casts a shadow over the area of thought in the brain. End quote. Disoriented by the internal darkness caused by the black bile's infiltration of the brain, the melancholic, in extreme circumstances, became, became prone to hallucinations and delusions, and in turn to behaviors modern psychiatrists would classify as schizophrenic or psychotic. While people, of all while people of melancholic temperament were naturally predisposed to the disease, melancholia could afflict people of all temperaments through an excess of black bile. Because of the peculiar sympathy Galen posited between the origin of this humor, the spleen, and the organ of thought, brain, the most immediate culprit in such cases was diet. While the atrabilious quality of traditionally rich foods such as red wine, red meat, and aged cheeses made gluttony the most obvious risk factor, Galen also underscored the effects of undernourishment. <coughs> the paradoxical etiology remained embedded in discussions of the disease down through Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, where the dangers of excess are paired with its opposite, much fasting and waste, waking. Under these circumstances, according to Galen, the desiccation caused by the lack of nourishment would cause the overheated humors to combust, producing a highly toxic form of black bile, melancholia lusa. Just as, quote, when a sooty and smoke-like vapor is carried from the stomach to the eyes, equally and for the same reason, the symptoms of suffusion occur when an atrabilious evaporation produces melancholic symptoms of the mind by ascending to the brain like a sooty substance or a smoky vapor. Between these opposite risk factors, of over- and undernourishment, Galen was more concerned with the latter, to which he traced the more severe, or as he called it, bestial form of melancholy, in which the disease and the condition's signature symptoms of fear and despondency were compounded by hallucinatory, hallucinatory delusions that could erupt in violence. In such cases, the line became blurred between melancholia and its pathological cousin, mania. The acute form of melancholia described by Galen generated interest both within and beyond Arab medic and Latin medical circles well into and beyond the 13th century. When we turn to Vincent of Beauvais's encyclopedic account of this condition in his Speculum Naturalis, the most significant development is its name, Melancholia Canina, or Canine Melancholy. Like the Arab medical authorities to whom he defers, Haliabas and Reyes, the 13th century encyclopedist draws on the locus classicus of the 7th century physician Paulus Andronatus. They go about during the night, lingering around sepulchres till morning. You, were, you may recognize such persons by these marks. They are pale, their vision feeble, their eyes are dry and tongue very dry, <coughs> and the flow of saliva has stopped. But they are thirsty, and their legs have incurable ulcerations from frequent falls. They have not the expression of men, but of beasts. In this, the most suggestive form of melancholia, the offending humor's penetration of the brain so darkens the sufferer's reason as to efface his most ostensibly human characteristics. The condition described is perhaps more readily recognized by the other name under which it floated by virtue of its contradictory symptoms, lupine mania. Medieval victims of this disease, the ancestors of what we would now call werewolves, must be distinguished from their classical and contemporary counterparts. Even the literary heroes of what Carolyn Walker Bynum referred to as the werewolf renaissance of the 12th century are decidedly unspectacular by modern standards, that is, too human, or in Philippe Menard's estimation, fake. 
The lupine maniacs of medical and encyclopedic literature were not held to morph into the bodies of the disease's namesake. They were, however, considered prone to the animal's trademark violence, the most notorious example of which, since Plato's Republic, was the cannibalization of its young. Here, the prophetic quality of the nightmare Ugolino recalls assumes a further layer of significance. And this is the final citation. Dentro dalla mira, la qual per me antipolo la fama, e che conviene ancora che altrui si chiuda, ma vea mostrato per lo suo forame più lume già, quando io feci il mazzonno, che del futuro mi scorciò il rame. Questi parea a me maestro e donno, cacciando il lupo e i lupicini al monte, perché i pisan veder lupo non pone. Con cagne madri studiose e conte, volandi con sismondi con manfranchi, si avea messi dinanzi dalla fronte, in piccio corso mi parea in stanchi, lo padre e i figli, e con la gude scanne mi parea loro veder fendere i fianchi. In the vivid hunting scene through which the Count envisions his family per family's pursuit by Ruggeri, the climactic transformation of the wolf and little cubs into a father and his sons features a prophecy by reversal of Ugolino's, Ugolino's psychological disintegration. The archetypal victim of Galen's beast from Radis comes to life in the week that follows, as starvation, foremost among the conditions causes, leads, leads Ugolino down a similarly dehumanizing path. Progressively deprived of tears, speech, and sight, he is finally left stumbling among the dead in an ominous reenactment of the physician's locus classicus. The morning the tower door is nailed shut and the fam family's daily rations are cut off, Anselmucho's innocent observation of his father's changed expression in line 51 marks the beginning of his father's transfiguration. As the desiccating effects of starvation take their toll, the prisoner's eyes become incapable of the tears, his shade now seeks as testament of the pilgrim's humanity. I did not weep, he recalls in line 49, and again in 52, I shed no tears, meanwhile urging the pilgrim to grieve on his behalf in line 42, for if you do not weep at this, about what do you weep? Meanwhile, the withered tongue forsworn by the pilgrim at the close of the February 32 reduces the prisoner to a bestial silence which the shade's exceptional eloquence throws into further relief. Nor did I reply all that day or the night that followed until the sun came forth into the world. And again, in line 64 and following, I quieted myself then so as not to make them sadder. That day and the next, we were all mute. As the week draws to its close, his vision finally fails leaving him to stumble among the open sepulchres of his children. Already blind, he tells us, I took to groping over each of them, and for two days I called them after they were dead. The psychological consequences of Ugolino's physiological decline are clinched at the conclusion of his speech, which Dante describes as follows. When he had finished, with eyes askance, he took the wretched skull beneath his teeth again, which were strong on the bone, like a dog's. The canine imagery's elusiveness to the prisoner's psychological condition only reinforces the structural and thematic ties between Ugolino and the archetypal melancholic. Did Ugolino, like Saturn, devour the flesh of his four children? Reduced to this quintessential form of madness, he may well have. The thrust of Dante's clinical portrayal of a starved body's power over a mind ruled by reason leads to a more elemental question. Should he be blamed? If the cannibalistic feast suggested by Ugolino's ambivalent last lines constitutes the most abominable act recalled in hell, it is not only irrelevant to his damnation, but morally irreprehensible. Far from a travesty of divine justice, the moral indifference of the shade suggested cannibalism is a testament to divine justice's coherence. I return now to the moral category of mad bestiality to which I alluded earlier to show how its relationship to the condition of bestial madness exhibited by Ugolino and the Tower of Hunger, pertains to the relative fates of both Ugolino and Virgil. The moral disposition in question emerges in Virgil's explanation of the topography of hell in Inferno 11. Elaborating on the Ciceronian distinction between the two forms of malice punished in lower hell, force and fraud, Dante's guide goes on to describe the layout of the entirety of Inferno through the three moral categories discussed by Aristotle in Book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Incontinence, malice, and mad bestiality. Dante's understanding of this latter category of sin and of its place in hell has been the cause of considerable confusion over the years. If the malice which Virgil subdivides into force and fraud corresponds to the malice he distinguishes from incontinence and mad bestiality, 
where are we to situate the last of this Aristotelian triad? Early commentators took for granted a grammatical and spatial correspondence in Virgil's indications, locating mad bestiality in the ninth circle of hell, where the most grievous form of fraud's two forms, treachery, is punished. Modern Dante scholarship is generally disinclined to this interpretation based on Aristotle's conclusion at the end of the relevant section of the ethics that bestiality is, quote, less culpable than malice, albeit more terrifying. Bestial madness has accordingly been identified with the seventh circle of hell, that of violence. But as Alfred Trillo showed in his meticulous examination of Aristotle's conception of bestiality and those of his medieval commentators, the predominant crisscross solution makes short shrift of the original Aristotelian distinction between the two forms of bestiality, bestial incontinence and bestial malice, to be distinguished from incontinence and malice simply. The form that is less culpable than malice, albeit more terrifying, is presumably the former, incontin bestial incontinence, the condition described in the immediately preceding chapter of the Ethics, where cannibalism is given pride of place among its various manifestations. But while incontinence simple is more morally reprehensible than its bestial counterpart, which is the result of either custom, as in the case of savages isolated from rational civilization, or more commonly, of disease, the same does not necessarily hold for malice simple and its digital counterpart, of which Aristotle makes no direct comparison in the present treatise. In his treatment of bestiality outside the context of the ethics, however, and within the context of injustice, it is described as an excessive degree of malice. As for the symptoms of such bestiality, we are given a rele relevant indication in the politics, where injustice is deemed savage when executed through those weapons which pertain to man alone by virtue of his intellect. These are identified by Aquinas in his commentary on this work as the vice vices of false prudence, shrewdness, and fraud. Nowhere is this bestiality more manifest for the Dominican theologian than in the taking of morbid pleasure in exacting excessive punishment. It follows that a man can be made bestial in two ways, either through the exercise of one's most, most human faculties in order to bring about injustice, or through so grievous a disordering of the reason as to annihilate its subject will. While the former exceeds to the highest degree of culpability, the latter dips below its radius. Cannibalism and the exacting of excessive punishment. These are the examples we are afforded of bestial incontinence and bestial malice, which lead us back to Ugolino and Ruggeri and to the conclusions of my talk. If this is a valid reassessment of the relevant texts and commentaries on which Dante may have drawn in his conception of mad bestiality, nowhere are the nuances of this moral category more perceptible than in the relative sinfulness of his political traitors. When we return to Ugolino's savage feast, the fate of his will, the rational appetite that distinguishes man from beast, takes on a pitiful transparency. Eternally ravaged there where the brain joins with the nape, the Archbishop's divine punishment literalizes that of his earthly prisoner. Having sentenced Ugolino's will to the lowliest of appetites through a perversion of earthly justice, the seed of his own is now fittingly devoured. Damned to the ninth circle of hell for the most human of sins, treachery, Ugolino perished as a beast. Whatever the contents of his betrayal may have been, the sale of Pisa's castles to its neighbors to secure the feast, his shifting of political alliances from Ghibelline to Guelph and back to Ghibelline, or the betrayal of his grandson and political rival, Nino Visconti, they are pointedly overshadowed by the bestiality of Ruggeri, whose silent shade has denied those traces of humanity conceded to the The eloquent hybrid that emerges from the ice of Placidus is at once a testament to divine justice as well as mercy. <laughs>